The Lord, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy, the beginning of the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham became the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah became the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez became the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Aram, Ram the father of Amminadab. Amminadab became the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rehob. Boaz became the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed became the father of Jesse, Jesse the father of David the king. David became the father of Solomon, whose mother had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon became the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Abijah, Abijah the father of Asaph. Asaph became the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat the father of Joram. Joram the father of Uzziah, Uzziah became the father of Jotham, Jotham the father of Ahaz, Ahaz the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah became the father of Manasseh, Manasseh the father of Amos, Amos the father of Josiah. Josiah became the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the Babylonian exile. After the Babylonian exile, Jeconiah became the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Abiud. Abiud became the father of Eliakim, Eliakim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok. Zadok became the father of Achim, Achim the father of Eliud, Eliud the father of Eleazar. Eleazar became the father of Mathan, Mathan the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Of her was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Thus, the total number of generations from Abraham to David is 14 generations. From David to the Babylonian exile, 14 generations. From the Babylonian exile to the Christ, 14 generations. Now this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. Such was his intention when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. For it is not through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived, for it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke, <clears throat> he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took his wife into his home. He had no relations with her until she bore a son, and she, he named him Jesus. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Merry Christmas, everybody. After writing this sermon, this homily, I realized it wasn't really that much about Christmas, but I'll explain why. Uh, if you've attended Mass here over the last four weeks, which you may or may not have, uh, if you want to catch up on those sermons that I've given, uh, go to YouTube, search my name, or to our parish's Facebook page. Uh, this homily would probably make a little bit more sense if you had heard uh, the last four weeks. But over the last four weeks of Advent, I have tried to simplify the Christmas message down into just four words. These four words were the same four words that hung as banners from each of the four candles in the Advent wreath that, that stood in the, in the front of my childhood church growing up at St. Vincent de Paul Church in Seward, Nebraska. When I was a child, I, I looked forward to there being a new lit candle and a new banner every week and and a new word on those banners each week of Advent. But as I grew older, I thought more and more that those four words were a little bit cheesy, a little too idealistic, words that 
that hippies use, to be frank. Those, and those four words are <clears throat> hope, peace, joy, and love. And I think the reason that I had an aversion to these four words is because these four words are misused all of the time. We've seen the word hope used in political campaigns, but I can't think of a more dreadful thing than putting hope in a politician. Uh, we have seen the word peace used by idealists who are looking for absolute perfect harmony on earth, and that just isn't reality. Joy is so often associated with material things. If you watch the commercials on TV, joy is a bow on top of a new Lexus, or uh, social media is full of people who only show you the good parts of their life, <clears throat> and they appear to us as being fulfilled and joyful. And love, of all four of these words, love is the most misused. We are presented with a lot of garbage that masquerades as love. Often what people refer to as love is actually envy or desire or lust. But over the course of Advent, I've attempted to teach the actual meanings of these words, not the way these words are used in political campaigns or on greeting cards or in social media, but the true and fundamental meaning of these things, hope, peace, joy, and love. And once we have the correct understanding of what these four things are, then we will see that they are the best words, in fact, to explain and describe Christmas. You might be thinking, if you've been here these last four weeks, Father, you've already talked about this, let's move on to something else. But I have a point, and I'll get to it eventually. But first, uh, first I want to ask you this. You don't have to answer out loud, obviously. It's a rhetorical question. But do you know what the word Christmas means? You could probably guess. It comes from the Old English, and shocker of all shockers, it means Christ's Mass. Uh, Pretty simple. But that doesn't tell us much if we don't know what the word mass means. Well, mass is church, right? It's what, what Catholics call going to church. It's called mass. Well, not really. It kind of is. But the reason we use the word mass in English to describe what we do here when we come to church on the weekends or a holiday, it actually comes from the Latin words of the mass. To be specific, the very last Latin words of the mass. Uh, in Latin, instead of the priest saying the mass is ended, go in peace, or go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life, the priest says this, ite misa est. And if you translate ite misa est by the exact meaning of the words, it approximates this. It's not exactly exact because Latin doesn't translate into English the easiest. But it basically means this, go, the dismissal has been made which doesn't exactly roll off the tongue very easily in English. And it might seem a little bit cold, basically saying, go, you're dismissed. That's how Mass ends in the Latin Mass. Why, of all of the words that we hear when we attend Mass, do we refer to the entire thing, the entire celebration of the Eucharist, by the dismissal? I mean, if you think about it, it's basically like saying, hey, are you going to the dismissal on Sunday? Which, which, uh, which Christmas dismissal are you going to? Uh, it sounds ridiculous, right? It sounds silly. But that's the way we do it, and that's what we call it. Why? The reason why is because the dismissal is the whole point of going to Mass. You might say, oh yeah, because we get to leave. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, you might say the Eucharist. Well, the Eucharist, isn't that the most important part of Mass? And I'll say, yes, the Eucharist is the most important part of the Mass, but it's not the point of the Mass. You are here, yes, to be nourished by the fellowship that we share, by the, the Word of God that we hear in the Scriptures, and above all, by the sacrament to the body and blood of Jesus. But that nourishment is for a reason. It would completely go to waste if you left the graces that you received at church here, in this church. The whole point of the Mass is so that you can be nourished by the Word of God, by the fellowship we share, and above all, by the body and blood of Jesus, so that you can bring Jesus to other people. If the Mass isn't just about you, 
and your personal relationship with Jesus. If it were just about you and your personal relationship with Jesus, then what would be the point of us all gathering here? Is it to listen to some nice music? To hear the words of a priest that may or may not be good at public speaking? You can do all of that on your own. The point of the Mass is this, that it is your energy source to go out and spread the gospel. It is your fuel out in the world where you are called by your baptism to be a witness to the gospel message. So let's go back to why Christmas is called Christmas. It's because we celebrate Christ being dismissed, quote unquote, dismissed into the world. He's being sent out into the world. That's what Christ's Mass literally means. But here's the thing. We don't actually know the day on which Jesus was born. Scripture gives us an idea of the year, but we don't know the day. And then there's all of these other events surrounding the birth of Jesus, the shepherds arriving, the wise men coming from the east, the killing of the firstborn, the flight into Egypt. And those events, they all took place days or even years after Jesus was born. So to simplify it all, to celebrate the birth of Jesus, we chose one day, the church did, December 25th, and the church chose that day very deliberately because in the pagan Roman Empire that worshipped the Roman pantheon of gods, December 25th was a harvest holiday in honor of the Roman god Saturn, called Saturnalius. And so we Christians took that pagan feast day and we baptized it as Christ's mass, Christ coming into the world. But guess what? Every day is Christmas. Because every day you, as a Christian, are asked to bring Christ into the world. That is a fact of your baptism. That is why the Mass is called the Mass, because the dismissal is the point. The dismissal is where we begin our task. Attending Mass isn't the fulfillment of our of our duty as Catholics, as Christians, it's only the beginning point of our duty as Catholics and as Christians. We take the name Christian seriously because we are called to model our life after Christ, and that doesn't happen merely within the four walls of this building. It happens wherever you go. So over the past four weeks, I've tried to equip you with some tools to be able to do that better, tools that uh, summarize the correct understanding of the four words from those Advent banners at my home parish of hope, peace, joy, and love. In each of the four weeks of Advent, I've given you homework, and I'm afraid that I've pulled one over on you because the homework, well, that was just practice for the real thing. Our real assignment as Christians is to live those four words every day, to bring those four words outside of this building and out into the world. Now that Christmas has begun, the real homework begins. So let's take one last work, one last look at those words to live by. First, hope. Live your life in a way that does not place hope on anything but God. I know we like to say that we do that, but do we really? How often do we place our hope in in a vote, in politics, in Tucker Maddow or Rachel Carlson. See what I did there? Uh, If you place your hope in those things, I promise you the result will always be misery. You will always have something to complain about. How often do we place our hope in material things, in money? Money always leaves us wanting more. And so we need to get rid of that desire. How often do we place our hope in our friends or our family? They're human, they're imperfect, they're flawed. Why put that kind of pressure on them? Don't place your hope in anything that isn't eternal, in anything that isn't perfect, in anything that isn't true. Don't even place your hope in yourself, and that's the hardest one not to do, because we tend to be stubborn and we want things our way, and when we fail or realize we can't do something, even if we've tried really hard at it, that realization, that can be devastating, which is why it's a good idea to only place your hope in God. Second, peace. The true understanding of peace has nothing to do with the way things are going in this world. The entire world, your entire life can be burning down around you and falling to pieces, and you can still be at peace. 
Because peace is knowing who you are and who God is. Peace is knowing that in God you have everything you need. Peace is knowing that you are his child and that you are loved unconditionally. <clears throat> Third is joy, or we could just say happiness. And we can find joy in the littlest things. If you take things that normally annoy you and worry you and simply take a breath and take a step back and trust in God, you'll be a lot happier. If you let the little things go, if you cease holding on to things that you wish that you had control over, holding on to grudges, you will be a much more joyful person. And finally, love. And love is desiring what is best for someone else. And the best that you can desire for another person is their salvation. If you aren't bringing someone closer to Christ, then you are falling short in your love for them. So look at your relationships, whether they be personal or professional or familial, and see whether or not you are leading those people to heaven. That can happen by your attitude. It can happen by your example, and certainly by your actions and your words. Desiring what is best for someone might mean simply praying for them because of distance, or because you know a confrontation might not help things. So today, we celebrate the birth of Jesus. We celebrate God coming to this earth. He came to this earth so that we might be saved, but he also came to this earth to give us the tools to bring other people to him. It is Christ's Mass. It is Christmas. As Jesus is being born, we are being dismissed into the world to share that good news.